All right, we're going to start today on slide 24 and going through, I already forgot what it said, 43. Endosymbiosis. What does symbiosis mean? Which we've talked about symbiotic relationships. What is that? I know what it is, I just can't. Can you give me an example of a symbiotic relationship? Um, how many of you have ever had to pick a tick off a dog or a cat? Okay, that is a symbiotic relationship. Can you tell me what symbiotic relationships are now? <laughs> Close, yes. Is it like where like one thing lives on something and it like hurts the other thing. Sometimes it can hurt the other thing. Sometimes it actually helps the other thing. And sometimes it has no effect whatsoever. Symbiotic relationships are two living things that live together with one another. It can be harmful, helpful, or have no effect. Whoops. Eukaryotic cells have organelles. Organelles, John, eyes up here. Organelles, take this out. Organelles are mitochondria, um, cell membrane, nucleus, um, ribosomes. Those are all organelles. Uh, though they are fundamental units of life, eukaryotic cells are composed mainly of many small parts called organelles. Like the organs in your body, each organelle carries out a specific required function. Some of them transport waste to the cell membrane and out of the cell transforming energy in glucose into energy and cell function, maintains cell structure, and makes large biomolecules. Specialization of organelles and eukaryotic cells allowed them to become much larger and more efficient than their prokaryotic predecessors. Uh, why is this thing jumping? Organelles are built out of molecules that are built from atoms. Organelles work together to carry out the functions of cellular life. Let's see how they compare in size. Oh, we've looked at this last year when you look at the difference in the size. And then it goes down smaller, smaller. All the way, here we're down to viruses. There's your ribosome, tRNA. All the way down to a carbon atom. I always forget how to go back, and that's on it. Hmm. That's not it either. I did, I've done it, but. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, which of the following ranks cells, molecules, organelles, and the atoms in the order of size complexity from smallest or least to largest in the grade? Organelles, molecules, cells, and atoms. Cells, atoms, molecules, organelles. Organelles, cells, atoms, molecules. Atoms, molecules, organelles, cells. Which one goes from smallest to largest? D is correct. Nice job, John. I knew the answer right after you said it. Sure. <laughs> no, I actually did. Okay, but good. Because I thought of an atom. And there you go. Yes, that's the smallest one. Um, eukaryotic organelles, mitochondria, vacuole, cell wall, Golgi apparatus. That is the word yesterday that I could not think of. Golgi apparatus. Uh, endoplasmic reticulum, smooth and rough, ribosomes, lysosomes, chloroplasts. Um, these and those are in um, plant cells. The evolution of organelles. All eukaryotic cells have mitochondria, organelles that transform the energy from food molecules into a form that is usable by cells. Evolution of mitochondria allowed cells to become more efficient and um, it's one of the factors that allowed eukaryotes to become more complex. The evolution of organelles. All eukaryotic cells have mitochondria to convert food into a more usable form of energy for the cell. Prokaryotic cells use the cell membrane to convert food into a usable form of energy. 
Uh, mitochondria resemble prokaryotes in size and shape. Scientists wondered if these similarities might be a clue to the origin of eukaryotic cells. The evolution, okay, so remember here we're talking about plants when we say um, chloroplasts, you see the green here. Um, such as plants and some protists have chloroplasts that convert the sunlight to chemical energy. So that's the part of the plant that takes the energy from the sun and is part of the process in order that the plant makes food for itself. Photosynthetic bacteria use their cell membranes to carry this out this function. Chloroplasts are also the size of prokaryotes. Scientists wondered if that similarity in size was another clue about the origin of eukaryotic cells. One more clue. Mitochondria and chloroplasts each have their own DNA, their own ribosomes, their own double cell membrane. What does this tell you? There is probably what? Some sort of a connection between prokaryotes and what? Eukaryotes. Okay. They have cells. The theory of endosymbiosis. I'm going to back up here. And I'm not even going to attempt to say her name because I don't have a clue. In 1905 and in 1910, proposed the theory of endosymbiosis. Other scientists elaborated on the theory. Oh, this is actually in 1971. That's Lynn Margulis, I guess. Provided experimental evidence that validated the theory in the two articles, Symbiosis and Evolution and the Origin of Plant and Animal Cells. The theory states that two billion years ago, mitochondria and chloroplasts were li free living prokaryotes that were absorbed by other prokaryotes. The theory of endosymbiosis. Mitochondria was once a bacterium that e uh, efficiently converted glucose into simpler form of energy. The chloroplast was once a bacterium that could perform photosynthesis and create glucose. The theory of endosymbiosis is consistent with the process of natural selection. Uh, endosymbiosis. In each case, the prokaryotes were more successful together than they were apart. At first, they formed mutualistic symbiotic relationships. What would mutualistic be? Harmful, helpful, no benefit. Helpful. Um, the mitochondria could furnish the usable energy needed for itself and host prokaryote. Um, the chloroplast could provide glucose for itself and the host pro prokaryote. The host prokaryote offered a stable environment for the mitochondria and or the chloroplast. Endo, this is just breaking down the word, within, together, bio, life, uh, SIS would be conditions. Let's see. Maybe. Is that a what if you could absorb another organism and take on its abilities? Imagine you swallowed a small bird and suddenly gained the ability to fly. Or if you engulfed a cobra and were then able to spit poisonous venom from your teeth. Sounds sweet. Throughout the history of life, specifically during the evolution of complex eukaryotic cells, things like this happened all the time. One organism absorbed another, and they united to become a new organism with the combined abilities of both. We think that around two billion years ago, the only living organisms on Earth were prokaryotes single-celled organisms lacking membrane-bound organelles. Let's look closely at just three of them. One was a big, simple, blob-like cell with the ability to absorb things by wrapping its cell membrane around them. Another was a bacterial cell that converted solar energy into sugar molecules through photosynthesis. A third used oxygen gas to break down materials like sugar and release its energy into a form useful for life activities. 
The blob cells would occasionally absorb the little photosynthetic bacteria. These bacteria then lived inside the blob and divided like they always had, but their existence became linked. If you stumbled upon this living arrangement, you might just think that the whole thing was one organism, that the green photosynthetic bacteria were just a part of the blob that performed one of its life functions. Just like your heart is a part of you that performs the function of pumping your blood. This process of cells living together is called endosymbiosis, one organism living inside another. But the endosymbiosis didn't stop there. What would happen if the other bacteria moved in too? Now the cells of this species started becoming highly complex. They were big and full of intricate structures that we call chloroplasts, and mitochondria. These structures worked together to harness sunlight, make sugar, and break down that sugar using the oxygen that right around this time started to appear in the Earth's atmosphere. Organisms absorbing other organisms was one way species adapted to the changing environmental conditions of their surroundings. This little story highlights what biologists call the endosymbiotic theory the current best explanation of how complex cells evolved. There's a lot of evidence that supports this theory, but let's look at three main pieces. First, the chloroplasts and mitochondria in our cells multiply the very same way as those ancient bacteria, which are still around, by the way. In fact, if you destroy these structures in a cell, no new ones will appear. The cell can't make them. They can only make more of themselves. Second piece of evidence. Chloroplasts and mitochondria both contain their own DNA and ribosomes. Their DNA has a circular structure that is strikingly similar to the DNA of the ancient bacteria, and it also contains many similar genes. The ribosomes, or protein assembly machines, of chloroplasts and mitochondria also have the same structure as ribosomes of ancient bacteria but are different from the ribosomes hanging around the rest of the eukaryotic cell. Lastly, think about the membranes involved in the engulfing process. Chloroplasts and mitochondria both have two membranes surrounding them, 